Roman times, the great Essex Road has run like a spit through the county. The road narrows at Ingotstone to a bottleneck, where the high street has changed little during the past four centuries. The brick tower of the church points above the old houses, once called Apple the Stone, clustered about its base. The villagers pass on their way to church, the ancient stone from which the little doomsday settlement of Ing derives its name, Ing at Stone. The church shelters the tombs of that family whose lives have been bound up to the story of the village for 400 years, the Peter family. Here lies the first of the Essex Peters, Sir William, a Devon man, with his second wife beside him. From church and stone, an ancient pathway crosses the fields to the lane along which Queen Elizabeth passed in 1561 to visit the hall newly rebuilt by Sir William. Part of it is leased to the Essex County Council for the display of old documents, but Sir William's direct descendant, the 17th Lord Peter, still owns the hall and lives there. Pollarded lime trees line the avenue to the gatehouse. Below the one-handed clock is the family motto, Saint Dieu Rien, without God, nothing. Through the gatehouse arch, beyond daisy-covered lawns, is the main block of Ingotson Hall. Above Lord Peter's own front door is the long gallery. These windows still have the molded brick mullions and transoms built by Sir William. Sir William Peter, one of the new men of the Tudor age, the civil servant, able and devoted in his public service. Sir William, the just and fair landlord. Sir William, the kind and generous father and founder of his line of unbroken male descent. Sir William, visitor of the monasteries, privy councillor, chancellor of the garter, and secretary of state to Henry VIII, Edward VI, Queen Mary, and Queen Elizabeth, died 1572. Sir William came to Essex as the last tenant of the Abbey of Barking, which had held the manor through the Middle Ages. When Barking Abbey was dissolved, he bought the manor for £849.12 and sixpence, paid by instalment. The final receipt is pitched to the Crown Grant itself which bears a portrait of Henry VIII in the initial letter and Henry's own great seal. When Sir William bought the estate, he planned a mansion, for the hall at that time was, as his surveyor said, scant meat for a farmer to dwell upon. He settled into this humble home and built steadily for ten years the three new sides which enclosed the courtyard, the original hall forming the fourth side. Smaller additions were made later. 150 years ago, the original hall was pulled down, leaving the buildings as they are today. With the terrace staircase, crow-stepped gables, Tudor chimney stacks and mullion windows. Since the 16th century, visitors have always entered the hall through the gatehouse archway. In the buildings flanking the gatehouse, 
The hall servants and dependents have lived throughout the ages. The head gardener today lives near that part of the grounds which have always been a garden since it was planned by Sir William. And through it lies the path to the public room. The Bachelor's Hall is the first of a series of rooms which display records of the past in Essex. These are changed at regular intervals. But the heart of the building is the long gallery. One fair and stately gallery or walk meet for any man of honor to come into. The great fireplace once filled the alcove on the left, and beside it was a door which opened into the family chapel. Generations of Peters have walked on these wide, uneven floorboards, gleaming with the polish of centuries, and here they have talked with their friends and listened to the services in their private chapel. From his frame, Sir William, whose ghost is said to walk this gallery, looks out upon the family. His second wife, Anne Brown, mother of John, Sir William's only son and heir, devoted mother and stepmother to Sir William's five daughters. Her son, John, the first Lord Peter, his face is the countenance of a poised, self-reliant and complete man, perhaps a little reserved, withdrawn and detached. John, the friend and patron of William Byrd, the great Elizabethan composer, whose music is preserved in one of John's manuscript books. Music which delighted John Peter and his wife Mary at Christmas time, 1589, when Bird came from town on Boxing Day, and when a new iron bracket was set up to hold the double virginals. Stout-hearted Mary Brown, widow of the Third Lord, who defied Cromwell's soldiers as they were beating at the gates of the hall. Her son, the Fourth Lord, who died in the tower, a victim of the infamous Titus Oates. the seventh Lord Peter, gay and dashing, who caused a violent quarrel between the Peter and Farmer family, a prank immortalized by Pope in his poem, The Rape of the Lock, the moving points the sacred hair dissever from the fair head forever and forever. The ninth Lord, who led the movement to repeal the harsh laws against Roman Catholics, so that the 11th Lord and his successors were able once more to play a part in public affairs, in cravat and greatcoat, in full bottom wig and knee breeches, in velvet and ruffles, the family of the past lined the walls. The Peters are still here in this peaceful corner of Essex, and the present Lord Peter now goes by car along the drive his ancestors used for carriage and coach. How well Sir William Surveyor's words describe Ingotston Hall today, though 400 years have passed. Very fair, large and stately, made of brick and embattled. Now mellowed by time and enriched by history.